I will be talking about warping cache simulation of polyhedral programs. Um, so I'm sure everybody knows that caches are important, but let me uh, give you another uh, example of, or, or illustration of, uh, you know, that that is actually the case. So, so what we see here is a die shot of a current AMD Zen 3 processor. And uh, what you can see is that the die is sort of dominated by a cache. So uh, even if you zoom in uh, to the cores, you can see that L1 and L2 caches are occupying lots of the die area. So uh, caches are very important for performance. At the same time, cache behavior is uh, non-obvious. So here's a simple example. Uh, so we see a kind of straightforward dense matrix multiplication code. And um, if I run this on my uh, desktop computer, then I get these results. So I get a bunch of cache misses, L1, L2 misses, it takes 28 seconds. So now let's say I'm doing a little loop interchange. So I'm in, uh, interchanging the, the innermost loops and I get a new code. And some of you might have seen this, so you might have an idea of what's gonna happen. But if you run this, you see that the number of cache misses drastically shrinks, right? And so, um, and also does the execution time. So we get about a 5x speed up due to this simple transformation. All right, and I would argue that, um, yeah, it's not so easy to see that uh, unless you're very experienced. So what can you do about this? So one sort of straightforward approach is to apply simulation to better understand the cache behavior of your code. And so the kind of straightforward approach to that is trace-based cache simulation. And in trace-based cache simulation, what you do is you essentially couple two elements. So you couple a program simulator that simulates the program, generates the sort of sequence of memory accesses, and then feeds that into a cache simulator part that determines how the cache behavior of that program is going to be. So uh, this has some advantages and some disadvantages. So the advantage is that, that this kind of approach can be applied to essentially uh, arbitrary programs and also to more or less arbitrary cache configurations, right? You just need to build a corresponding simulator that, that does what your cache design does. The drawback of this is that this can be extremely costly. So in particular, because you generate this explicit access trace, um, the analysis time is always going to be proportional to the length of the trace that is generated by the code. And uh, the simulator is much slower than the hardware, and so this can take you know, thousands of times um, uh, the time that it would take to execute. So this can take a very long time for interesting code. So there's a second uh, line of work uh, to do with this problem, and this is what I would call analytical cache models. And so these differ um, from uh, the trace-based simulation in two ways. So first, they rely on some sort of implicit representation of the memory access behavior. And so uh, they extract uh, such a model, and uh, I'm going to refer to the programs that can be dealt with uh, this kind of approach as polyhedral programs. So that's a restriction on the kind of syntax of the programs and also on, the, on their behavior. So their behavior needs to be input independent so that you can reason about uh, these executions um, sort of analytically, right? And then typically we have Pressburger formulas or at least in the state of the art, we have Pressburger formulas to capture this access trace. Now, given that representation, this is sort of where the magic happens in the existing approaches, right? So they take these formulas and they build new formulas from the uh, formulas representing the trace that capture the set of uh, L1 or L2 misses uh, generated by that code. And then you can apply symbolic counting algorithms to determine uh, how many misses the program is going to generate. All right, so what is nice about this is that the analysis time can be de decoupled from the trace length. So you can have code that generates you know, billions of accesses and you can still analyze it in a few seconds. The drawback of this is that it's restricted uh, to you know, simple cache models. And of course, this class of programs that can be represented uh, in this uh, Pressburger way. All right, so let's have a, a closer look at the state of the art. So there's two approaches that I think dominate uh, prior work. So the first one is polycache. And um, what you see here is that polycache is basically modeling multi-level non-inclusive set associative caches with least recently used replacement. The other state of the art work is Haystack. Haystack um, also models LIU caches, but it's limited actually to fully associative caches. 
So you might be surprised, this is a later work. It's somehow more restricted than polycash, but it's much more efficient. So that's why it's still interesting to consider it. All right. On the other hand, if you look at real-world cache configurations, uh, you see first that fully associative caches don't exist in the wild. Um, and you see that LIU doesn't, doesn't really exist. So for the processors that we know what's going on, you, you have uh, uh, various policies, some approximating LIU, some actually doing something sort of explicitly different uh, to, to uh, achieve better performance. And then there's also some systems where at least I wasn't able to figure out what, what they're doing, but it, it is not LIU. All right. So, um, yeah, what has been our goal in this work? Uh, so our goal has been to build a system that combines sort of the advantages of trace-based simulation with those of the analytical models. So we want to decouple analysis time from trace length. And we want to be able to support any kind of real-world cache configuration that people may have come up with. We will still be limited to this restricted class of programs because we need an analytical representation of the memory access behavior for this. All right, so how do we do this? So here's our approach in a nutshell. So the front end part of this is sort of similar to the existing work. So we um, derive this sort of Pressburger representation of the access trace. And then uh, for the back end, we combine two things. So we, we combine a kind of standard cache simulator. And you can basically plug in whatever you want here, right? So you've come up with a new cache um, algorithm. You can plug it in here. And then this is combined with a second component that we call a, a warping component. So this is basically, basically watching the simulator and when it detects certain patterns that are recurring, it uses that uh, pattern to warp over a sequence of accesses. And for this, it's then applying these polyhedral techniques. For, and for that, it, yeah, it also needs to know uh, kind of what the future memory accesses are in an analytical fashion. All right, so let's uh, do an example here. So let's look at this very simple uh, 1D stencil computation. And let's look at a fully associative LIU cache. Uh, so this is for the purpose of the example, but the whole thing generalizes to uh, more complex realistic systems. All right, so uh, I'm assuming here that each of the entries of these matrices are, um, are filling uh, exactly a uh, single cache line to simplify the reasoning. All right, and so we have this cache of size two uh, containing the MRU element here and the least recently U element there. So let's look at the first loop iteration. So it's going to access uh, A0, A1, and then B0 in that order. All of these accesses cost cache misses, so we have three cache misses. And we get the following cache state, right? So because B0 was accessed last, this is the most recently used block. A1 comes next, and so on. All right, so now if we go to the second loop iteration, things are slightly different. So we have the same access pattern, of course, but uh, the first access here to A1, that actually results in a cache hit, the next two result in cache misses. So we get one hit and two misses. All right, so if we continue doing this, if we look at the, uh, the third iteration, we see that this pattern is repeating, right? So we see that uh, we, we now access, well, A2, A3, A, B2, we get a, a hit here and we get two misses there. And indeed, if you continue doing this, uh, then the next uh, 995 iterations of the loop are going to kind of exhibit the same pattern, All right? And our uh, sort of high-level idea is that we want to detect such patterns and then uh, analytically warp across uh, the remaining iterations. All right, so let's look at this again um, and try to understand better how we can sort of rationalize that this kind of warping actually makes sense. So uh, what I have here is a bijection pi that maps a block to its successor. And if you look at the uh, situation here closely, then you can see that the cache state here after iteration two, um, if you apply this bijection to it, it brings you to the cache state after iteration three. Similarly, the access trace here between the second and the third iteration they're also related by that same bijection. 
And now we can exploit this to conclude that the state that we're going to reach here can be obtained also by the bijection uh, applied to this state. Similarly, for the next, uh, you know, 900 something iterations, the same uh, bijection applies to consecutive iterations. And this means that we can uh, basically compute the final cache state here uh, simply by applying the bijection, you know, to the 995, uh, which can be done very easily, uh, assuming that these bijections have a simple shape. Okay. So what's going on here? What's sort of the basis of this reasoning? The basis of this reasoning is a data independence property that to our knowledge, kind of any cache that is around there uh, satisfies, right? So what, what is this? So it's basically uh, the following situation. So we have a cache state. We have a sequence that transforms that cache state into a new cache state. And now let's say we have some arbitrary bijection and uh, we apply this bijection here to our state C and that gives us state C D. And now we apply the um, transformed sequence to state D. Then we can conclude that the resulting state can be obtained by applying the, um, the bijection to the resulting state up here. So this diagram computes. And so what we're doing uh, basically is we're kind of using a special version of this, right, where, you, where D and C prime are the same. And so this is sort of one step uh, of the warping procedure that we've seen before. Okay, so the nice thing is that data independence is also satisfied by, you know, other cache replacement policies, not just LIU. Um, we analyze in the paper how it applies to set associative caches. So there are some restrictions there. Uh, but we can uh, work with those. And it also applies to arbitrary cache hierarchies. All right, so I won't have time to discuss this in detail, so uh, for that I refer you to the paper uh, where we also look into how you symbolically simulate uh, behavior to efficiently detect um, pairs of states for which such bijections exist. And we also show how you can use polyhedral techniques to see how far uh, you can apply such warping. All right, so we implemented this, of course, and we did an experimental evaluation to see whether it works. And so for this experimental evaluation, we had a couple of goals. So first, of course, we wanted to know, you know, is this actually effective? Is this going to improve performance or not? And two, you know, does it actually matter to accurately model real-world caches? Maybe fully associative LIU is good enough and uh, so why bother, right? All right, so, so here are some experimental results. So this is on the uh, Polybench benchmark suite, which is a well sizable set of benchmarks that satisfy the constraints of this polyhedral model. And what you see here is a speed up across these benchmarks um, of the warping simulation relative to the non-warping simulation where we just go through the explicit trace. Right. And so, first we observe that there is, um, you know, a large set of benchmarks for which warping doesn't work because you just don't find such matching states. On the other hand, there are some benchmarks where you see very large speed ups, right? So we have a logarithmic scale here, so you can get speed ups of, you know, the order of 10,000, for example. And so in particular, stencil kernels are benchmarks for which this seems to work well. Now, I promise that this, uh, you know, applies not only to LIU, so here are the same, sort of same numbers for a bunch of other policies, some of which uh, you've seen in the previous slides on, on the existing uh, hardware. And you can see that the speedups are similar for most of these policies. There's, uh, you know, a little bit less speed up for, uh, for this complex policy because there's more policy states, so it's less likely to find uh, matching states. All right. Um, so does it matter to model real-world caches? So what you see here is the um, number of misses relative to um, uh, set associative LIU across these benchmarks. And you can see that, well, it depends on the benchmark, right? So there are some benchmarks where it doesn't really matter, probably because the data set is either way too large or way too small for the cache, and then it kind of doesn't matter what kind of replacement you do. Uh, but there are also many examples, in particular here do this to which end, where there's a huge gap between fully associative LIU and set associative LIU, 
And there's also a big gap between, uh, for example, SRIP and LIU. All right, so that concludes my talk, and I'm happy to take any questions. Hi, uh, great talk and uh, great applications too. I, I guess uh, you quantified the uh, constraints that you have on the program, uh, but the, the bisection that you came up with for the CAS state, uh, like, can you just like quantify the constraints that it should follow in like a, maybe a single sentence? Um, okay. Because you have so, to calculate the trans the closure for that. Uh, so, right. Um, so the question is what kind of shapes for the bijections do we support, right? Um, yeah, so, uh, okay, so I'm a little bit jet lagged, so I'm a little bit slow, but um, uh, so let me, uh, yeah, okay. Um, so, so these will be uh, situations where, so, so what we do internally is we have this uh, uh, symbolic simulation. And so the symbolic simulation will actually represent the cache states in terms of the loop iterators. And so then a matching state is a situation where, for example, here we would have B of I minus two and B A of I minus one, and this is the same. Um, and so then there are certain bijections that are implied by such, uh, by such matching symbolic states. So I'm not sure we actually you know, characterize them in that, uh, you know, in terms of the bijections that are implied, but we basically uh, look at the bijections that you get from matching uh, symbolic states. Um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, though, the, those bijections will have a very simple shape, so they will have, uh, you know, constant offsets, for example. Uh, so, as in the example that we have here. But yeah, I should I should think about it a little more. Okay. Thank yeah, you. That makes sense. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm wondering, what is the dominating factor of the complexity of this approach? Like, what, how like how the size of the problem is defined? Like how you were defining the size of the problem you are simulating. Uh, okay, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. So, uh, so of course, I mean, it's, um, you know, uh, in the worst case, we're gonna see the same or performance as explicit uh, enumeration of the axes. So sometimes we can do much better. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so, yeah, worst case performance is sort of in the same order as existing work. I see. Uh, the speed ups can be, um, yeah, almost arbitrarily large. Um, right. So, so one factor that you you can consider here is the size of the cache, right? So, if the size of the cache is small, uh, then, uh, for example, this warm up phase here is going to be short, and you can quickly find matching states. If your cache is very large and your program, for example, doesn't fully utilize that, uh, then you're in trouble with the approach that we have here. I see. Yeah, I have a question. So mm -hmm. I saw one of your results had, you know, a speed up that was actually a slowdown. I think it was a Gram Schmidt. Right. Uh, do you have any insights why that may be? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so, okay, so I should say that, um, we have some tricks in the implementation, right? So, uh, so basically, if you know, if the implementation sort of determines that matches are never found, uh, then it sort of turns into a mode where there's, uh, you know, it tries finding matches less often, and so this usually works well, right? So that's why even if it doesn't work, we get slowdowns of like ten percent, twenty percent. It seems like Graham Schmidt is a case where once in a while you do find a match but not enough to offset the kind of overhead of, uh, of the approach. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess if we would tune that, um, you know, that uh, heuristic, then we could probably get rid of, uh, of the sort of larger slowdown here for those benchmarks. Thank you. Uh, great work. So what is the dominant factor for performance? I mean, is it from IAP integer linear programming? Uh, so the question is sort of what's dominating yeah, the, the, yeah. the cost here? Yeah, what, yes. All right. Um, so, well, as you can see, I mean, down here, uh, when we have the slowdown, we don't have much of a cost. So mm -hmm. at least, you know, when the heuristics work, there's little overhead. Um, if you look at these cases, yeah, it's, uh, we, we didn't analyze it in detail. I mean, we, we see these large speed ups. Um, so, um, 
Yeah, I can't. I can't sort of dig deeper here. I mean, it's. I see. So. So. Um, so. Okay. So maybe one. Yeah, I think I don't have a slide on this, right? But. Um, but one thing that we did to analyze, uh, you know, the speed up, is we we determined sort of how much of the iteration space can we warp across. Right, and what you do see is that uh, this is basically inversely proportional to the speed up. Right, so so if you want to get a very large speed up, you need to basically warp across almost all of the iterations. Right, so if you if you warp across 99% of the iterations, you can get approximately a speed up of 100. And so this to us indicates that there is not a lot of additional overhead due to the machinery around. Yeah, so, so in the end, it's mostly determined by uh, how well can you apply warping. So, like warping, I think the key idea is that you can if it can find some test conditions. But if the like if the, there is a program of with four loops, and if the array A i plus k plus l and two dimensional array and j plus k plus l. Mm -hmm. Suppose that array is accessed, and I think the, there are n square number of corner cases. I suppose the array, array address accessed is i plus k plus l, yeah. and j plus k plus l like that. Mm -hmm. Then I think there are n square different corner cases. So because um, yeah. the pattern is very complicated. So mm -hmm. There are so many corner cases. In that case, uh, I think the simulation can be slow, right? Well, uh, I mean, when we do see the slowdowns, it's, it's basically because we don't find matching states, right? Um, and, and the patterns definitely have an influence on whether you can find matching states. So for example, uh, if you have multiple access expressions that are going through a memory, you know, for example, at different strides, then it's very unlikely that you will find sort of matching cache states. Uh, so I think this is the case for many of the benchmarks here where it doesn't work. In the stencil benchmarks, everything's sort of moving along at the same rate, and, and that's very nice for this kind of approach. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I have to read the paper. <laughs> yes, great. Well, th uh, th sorry. Oh. that's time. Uh, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.